recording. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you for coming to the last session of the day for uh, CFAIL 2020. Um, we're going to have an invited talk here at the, and then some time for Q&A afterwards. So please put some questions in the IECR chat as you think of them and we'll monitor that to post the speaker um, at the end. And so I'll pass it over to our program chair, Nikki, to introduce the talk. Thank you. Uh, I'll make my introduction very short uh, so that you have as much time as you um, would like to give the presentation. I just want to say, Steve, that we're extremely excited to have you here. Um, not many people have accomplished as much and have been in the field as long as you have. Also, even for those who have, there's only a smaller fraction who is actually uh, willing to talk about some of the things that didn't work and that failed. Um, I'm really, really uh, excited and looking forward to uh, what you're going to tell us about uh, IPSEC. And I think uh, I can speak in the name of all of the participants here that um, we are uh, very, very much looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Let me uh, share the screen here, get my slides up. Uh... If there's, if I saw the comment in the chat room about me being one of the people who would meant to use that. If there's time at the end, I will talk a little bit about the non-history, the almost history of Usenet and cryptography. There's some interesting stuff there, and that actually is in a blog post I'll point to later. Anyway, uh, so I want to talk about what is IPsec, how did it evolve, why is it the way it is, the origin, the technical cons constraints and the organizational, political, and other non-technical issues that contributed to the way it came out, good and bad. You know, one of the lessons is you know, non-technical issues really matter. This was cryptography meets the real world in many different dimensions. So IPsec was encryption at the IP packet layer, an IETF effort. The goal was to protect all packets without changing applications. And it had to conform to the IP service model. That is to say, it was going to be stateless. Every packet had to stand by itself. And of course, the IP service model assumes that packets can be dropped, duplicated, damaged. Correctness is end-to-end -end and handled by, the TC by TCP, the transport layer. But IP is at the IPsec is at the network layer, the IP layer. And this lets it protect all packets, even those from naive applications. And we saw, we envisioned three different scenarios, end system to end system, end system to gateway, typically a road warrior back to the corporate firewall, or firewall to firewall, gateway to gateway, for things like branch offices. The generic structure, as you know, the IP, layer at the bottom for routing through the internet, then an encryption header, then for example, TCP and user data, or if you're going to the encryptor to gateway or gateway to gateway, inside the encryption header, you have another IP header. So you can do the outer IP header is for routing on the open internet. The inner IP header is for say routing within the corporate network. And the history of it actually goes back the late 80, mid to late 80s, the Defense Department had a project called SDNS, Secure Data Network System, and they devised something called SP3, Security Protocol for Layer 3, the network layer. And in the 80s, and partly because it was a government project, they believed the world was going to convert to the OSI uh, protocols rather than IP, which they called the DOD Internet Protocols. And so the spec is written using OSI terminology, PDU for packet data unit, and NSAP network service address point, and military terminology like the red net, the inside unencrypted net, and the black net, the outside untrusted network. Interestingly, they made confidentiality and integrity both as optional services, a decision that played a very important part in the later history of IPSEC. And in keeping with the style of the OSI protocols, used variable length fields. So SP3 had a clear header, and a so-called protected header, 
which could provide integrity and or confidentiality. The clear header was just a length, a type field, and a key ID. The protected header, also a length, flags, padding, especially to deal with block size and alignment, and then the IP header and payload and such. The protected header was always integrity protected, which is necessary for access control. In the DOD world where you're trying to have you know, labels for top secret and bottom secret and so on, you want to uh, do integrity protection. Make sure that something that's supposed to be top secret will not be routed to an unclassified network. There was integrity only possibly for, as a, for the entire packet, possibly for export control. There was a confidentiality only mode. And one of the reasons for this is when this was designed in the 80s, cryptographic processing was expensive. And if you were dealing with high speed bulk data that could tolerate occasional bit errors, video and OFB mode, for example, you didn't care too much about every last bit of the packet. So you eliminate the integrity check and save some of the expense. And of course, because they expected to be using things like NSA type one algorithms, the SB3 spec gave no details on the algorithms to use. The, one of the interesting aspects is all of the cryptographic details, the algorithm, the block size of the cipher, the length of the integrity check value are identified by the key ID. The key ID is also uh, indexed to the permissible source and destination addresses, which you use for access control. And you used a separate process for uh, key negotiation. This is just the over the wire packets. The flag field had indicated the direction of the packet to prevent reflection attacks and use the same key ID in both directions. Key management was separate, partly to separate policy from mechanism, partly because it's a slower, much more complex process and it's done much less often. So if you're thinking in these terms, you put the per packet encryption in the kernel, though in those days, NSA would only do crypto and hardware, do key management at user level. You can have complex policies, checking CRLs and so on. You can negotiate multiple keys for different directions, integrity versus confidentiality, forward secrecy if you needed it and so on. That can be arbitrarily complex without affecting the over the wire encryption. Policies could be encryption and or integrity protection. What do you encrypt? How do you select the uh, encryption? Is it by destination IP address, by network address, by host name, port names? Crucially, what sh should have been encrypted when you receive a packet? That's just, this prevents someone from spoofing a packet coming at you. You could say a packet coming from this source address should have been encrypted, I will drop this packet. It is nice. It, it is not nice. And of course, the address of the decryption point, which could be a gateway. And that, you know, that was inside DOD. And a few years later, uh, Johnny Anitas and uh, Matt Blaze uh, devised something called Swipe, very much along the same lines. It was a simplification of SB3, eliminated most of the options, and they said, this is the internet, we're going with I, internet only, no OSI support. But they made one very crucial change that was not in the SP3 spec. They added a sequence number. Why? The paper says, quote, to protect against replay. No further explanation. In fact, when I quizzed Matt on this a few years later, he didn't have any better explanation other than that he had a gut feeling that it was needed. And this struck me as very curious because the IP service model, as I said, permits packet duplication. So why do you need to prevent replay when the underlying service might already permit replay? So one of the things the IETF does for better or worse is when they take a design from the outside like Swipe and many other protocols over the years, they assert the right to change it. If you're going to give it to the IETF, the IETF has the right to change it. So the IETF wanted a standard for packet level encryption at the network layer, the IP layer. And so IPsec was a descendant of SP3 and Swipe, 
And the people who designed IPSEC were very familiar with both of these protocols. In fact, uh, John and Matt were both part of the IPSEC process, especially early on. Why the changes? An internet standard does need to be more general and hence we have to have more options than swipe. For example, there was a desire to support multicast IP, back when we thought that was going to be very important, and mobile IP, which is used somewhat these days in IPv6 for or some cellular telephony, but uh, not very much on the open internet. Again, we didn't know this in 94 or so. So we wanted to make network layer encryption ubiquitous to protect all traffic, Maybe not, at least be able to protect all traffic. Maybe not pr actually protect all because computers were too slow then to encrypt everything. Remember that the only really strong cipher generally available in 1994 was DES. That was widely accepted. And DES is horribly slow in software. And people were still doing address based authentication. Instead of SSH, you had RSH, which used address based authentication. And with IP addresses having become dynamic, we knew that was not going to work. We wanted cryptographic authentication. And we decided to generalize what turned out to be too much, not just IP encrypt based on IP addresses, but host names, port numbers, which are a TCP concept, and even usernames. And so you could have two sessions between one pair of hosts, each encrypted with a separate key and multiple granularities of encryption, network pair, host pair, per user, per connection, and so on. Really spread out the traffic among multiple keys. But one of the problems we ran into was the US still had its export controls on cryptography, did not restrict authentication technology, but did restrict confidentiality technology. The, st the state of the cryptographic art was considerably more limited then than it is today. And the designers of IPsec, at least the ones who could talk openly and freely, there were some people with too many NSA connections, had somewhat limited cryptographic knowledge. We did not know as much as we thought we knew. So the first version, RFC 1825 through 29, had two different cryptographic headers, a confidentiality header and an authenticate ESP, the encrypting security uh, protocol, and the authentication header. And you could use them separately. Explicit transport versus tunnel mode for end-to-end -end versus end-to-gateway. A separate key management and policy protocol, though that was never defined. We had something called the SPI security parameter index, very much like the uh, key ID in SB3. And there was no sequence number. Why was there no sequence number? Because I said there shouldn't be. Absolutely a bad idea. It's an unnecessary field. Remember, the IP service model allows duplication. And Matt Blaze said I was wrong, but he couldn't give a reason. And I said, we don't want these extra four bytes in the packet. And I, and I won. It. So the packet layouts, yeah, you can look over here. I'm not able to draw on the screen here. You can see the, uh, on the left IP with the confidentiality pay payload or just with AH for uh, authentication only. Or if you look all the way on the right, you can see the authentication header covering the ciphertext that's protected by the ESP payload and fair number more combinations possible. The SPI was defined to be a random number. Why random? Someone said this will help prevent traffic analysis. Rather than using a flag to indi indicate direction, there was a separate SPI for each direction. Partly to avoid traffic analysis, you couldn't easily link traffic in opposite directions, but also because you had multicast, that, might, that would be a unidirectional channel. So we said separate SPI in each direction. But the SPI implicitly said what the source address was supposed to be. Confidentiality, again, you show uh, it looks fairly standard. The SPI, the initialization vector for your block cipher, your data, padding at the end, the length of the padding, and the next protocol to say it's IP coming next, it's a TCP coming next, or what have you. 
The padding was partially to deal with the block cipher uh, block length, but it could be increased up to a maximum of 255 bytes, again, as an attempt to evade traffic analysis. The authentication header was pretty similar, but it was defined to cover the IP header that came before it, not just stuff that came after it. This was a layering violation and made implementation very messy. And by the way, some parts of the IP header change on route, so you can't just protect all of the IP header. You need to know a fair amount of the semantics, including of the optional parts. Uh, but the advantage of using a separate header rather than just a policy is that it's export friendly. You can say, my system is not doing encryption. It's only using the authentication header. And a firewall could inspect packets going to and from that were protected with AH without needing to know the key that it would need to inspect an encrypted packet. There were reasons, I don't know that there were good enough reasons, but there were reasons for it. And I said, sequence numbers were controversial. Now there was a desire for RC4 for encryption. Again, we're talking mid nineties, RC4 is so much faster. But RC4 of course is a stream cipher, which you really don't want to use with manual key management. If you had an automated key management protocol, it could have worked. But we hadn't defined a key management protocol at that point. And there were a lot of people who said they wanted manual keying for a simplicity of implementation. So you had the desire for fast encryption, but you also had the desire for something that wouldn't work well if you had such fast encryption. So we had this conflict there. And then we started moving on to define key management. And the framework that was uh, eventually adopted was called ISACAMP, Internet Security and Key Management Protocol. The framework came from the NSA and that generated an amazing amount of paranoia about why was the NSA pushing an open key management uh, framework on the uh, on the community. What was wrong with it? What was sabotaged about it? There was no crypto in ISACAMP. The IETF defined uh, key, manage, uh, key management protocol, IEC Internet Key Exchange, roughly speaking, was an RSA signed dialogue with an op optional Diffie Hellman exchange for forward secrecy. There was an alternative proposed, much simpler than ISACAMP called Photurus. I'll come back to that. ISACAMP and Ike are horribly, horribly complex. It included, because it included session management as well as key negotiation, multiple phases, multiple authentication schemes. I'm not going to go into it today, but the original ISACAMP, in my opinion, was a disaster and had serious functionality bugs as well. There's a serious design mistake, which made it not very usable in one important uh, scenario. But there was another choice on the table besides ESP and H. And that was a protocol called SKIP, which came out of Sun Microsystems. And their reasoning was this. IP, the internet protocol, is a stateless datagram protocol. If you're going to use something with state, like doing key ne uh, negotiation and setup, then your gateways have to have state. It's no longer a pure datagram protocol. That, in fact, is why is a camp had session management. When do you delete these keys? So Sun Microsystems suggested skip, completely stateless. In the packet format, I'm not going to try to go into, into, in detail, but every host was going to have a certificate for a Diffie-Hellman exponential. So host A would have a Diffie-Hellman exponential. Host B would have a different Hellman exponential. When you ha have these two half exponentials, you calculate the Diffie Hellman exchange. And that lets you uh, get a key without negotiation. You just see this packet. 
and you use this Diffie Hellman uh, derived key to encrypt the actual traffic key. And that would give you forward secrecy, for example. So fairly complex protocol with many of the fields being optional integrity, encryption, a sequence number, even compression, were all optional and controlled by this flag field. And varying offsets depending on your options and algorithms make parsing difficult. The algorithm identifiers were sent in the clear, which concerned some people who were worried about traffic analysis. Your policy was less flexible. And the really serious problem is you are not negotiating algorithms. You needed universal algorithm agreement on what algorithms are going to be available and universal permanent agreement on the Diffie-Hellman parameters. And ultimately that last was the killer issue. But here's where organizational politics stepped in. First of all, there was quite a split about for tourists versus is a camp bike. A lot of people preferred for tourists because it was much simpler. Let's just call it personality complex, ruled out for tourists. That left Isacamp as the only choice if you wanted to use ESPAH. There was a bitter split and no consensus about ESPAH versus SKIP. And they kept adding features to SKIP to make it to add more functionality, but that added more complexity, such as adding optional forward secrecy. Ultimately, the working group deadlocked. Security area director Jeff Schiller at the time had to call it. To him, the inability to easily change the Diffie Hellman parameters was a showstopper for Skip. And Sun Microsystems itself had recently had a security problem with bad Diffie Hellman parameters. They did not think that a 256 bit modulus was insecure. And of course, it was. Brian Lamacchia had cracked it rather to their surprise. And if we look back and realize what happened, say, with Logjam, when people did not increase the size of the uh, Diffie-Hellman modules when they could have, we can see that that was a very wise decision to avoid uh, skip for that reason. So the final outcome was ESPAH1 over skip. Sequence numbers were del deleted from the standard. There were no design concessions for the export rules. We decided we're going to do it right technically and fight the government and the political layer. And integrity only was still a rational alternative because of the expense of devs and the need for firewalls to inspect the packet independent of the political issues. And this less is a camp and Ike is the only key management protocol left available. And so that won out. And that's when we realized there were problems. There were no good integrity algorithms. Not then. The, or the original scheme said, tag your key to one end of the packet and do a, a hash on that. And that will be your integrity check. HMAC had not yet been invented. Once it was, it was at least a drop-in replacement. Lack of sequence numbers turned out to be a mistake. Lack of mandatory integrity checks was a mistake. The suggested IV selection method, a simple counter was a mistake. Is a camp was a mistake. We just didn't have quite enough expertise. And we had a little bit of luck. A rumor had gone around that the NSA could break CBC encryption. Didn't seem right to me, but I decided to investigate. And that was a good idea. Well, we all know the properties of CBC in this audience. I'm not going to go over, over them. I'll just show you how, I, how it was possible to abuse this here. I made these certain assumptions that were very reasonable in 1996-1997. Host pair keying, a single key between each pair of hosts. Remember that you all had time sharing machines and not just personal computers. You had, it was reasonable to think that you had multiple people logging into a computer. So if you're doing encryption only with no authentication header, and maybe the attacker's got a login on one or both of the machines, and of course the usual assumption about access to the network, let's look at what can happen. So I send an encrypted packet protected by ESP, 
you know, confidentiality, no integrity. So you have the IS, the IP header and the ESP header and TCP and the data. The attacker with a login on the same pair of machines sends a UDP packet, a user datagram protocol packet, again encrypted with the same key. And what do you do? You splice together the IP and ESP header from your own packet with the payload of my packet. And IPsec on the receiving machine is going to do the decryption for the attacker. It was a simple cut and paste attack made possible by the properties of TCP and UDP and of course CBC mode. You could even hijack a session, same sort of thing. I could uh, take your TCP header and take and stick in a nasty command like uh, remove dash RF slash and glue it all together. I'll have to fix up the TCP checksum, but it's not that hard to do. And uh, 16, TCP only had a 16 bit checksum. It wouldn't be hard to do it by brute force. So I could take over your session and inject shell commands if I wanted to. Do. Many more attacks like these generate full-size packets, guess at passwords without a login on either machine, many, many more. What went wrong? We really needed sequence numbers. Benign accidental packet duplication is not the same as malicious retransmission. We really needed integrity checking. CBC's easy cut and paste properties make it crucial. And that rumor from the NSA Probably it was the IP algorithm. Predictable in, uh, initialization vectors are a serious weakness. When you look back at the mailing list archives, there were various people, people who attended crypto rather than uh, using security, et cetera, who understood more of this. They weren't as engaged with the working group. They contributed to the mailing list. They weren't there in person. And the in-person standards process and the uh, heavy involvement in the standard process really mattered. There were people in the IPsec working group who knew all of this, but uh, they had too much involvement with the NSA. When we finally decided to add the mandatory integrity field and the mandatory uh, sequence numbers and so on, Steve Kent, one of those people said to me, congratulations, you finally have all the right fields in there. Uh, yeah, he knew it all along, of course. So we threw out IPsec. And after I led the fight to take out sequence numbers, I led the fight to put it back in, which is what makes this so perfect for CFAL. Integrity checking can still be turned off, again, for high-speed bulk transmissions. It made me less than happy, but at least we had the sequence number field. So the new packet formats, you still had a AAs, but again, you always had a sequence number now. And we used HMAC instead of uh, something awful. AH still isn't needed. You don't need to protect the IP addresses. They're bound to the SPI. The most interesting fields in the IP header can't be protected because they change on route. And if you wanted authentication only, you could use the null cipher option with ESP. It's deprecated. People need, understand the need for more encryption. Of course, stuff's a lot faster today. It's obsolescent at least. And you, know, you look at this, the IP header, the TCP header and the ESP header all have sequence numbers. Are they redundant? And the answer is no. First of all, they serve different purposes. But from a security architecture perspective, the ESP sequence numbers are within the cryptographic module's trust boundary. TCPs aren't. And if you're trying to isolate your cryptography in a more secure module, possibly outboard hardware, you want to put the sequence numbers relied on by the cryptography inside the cryptographic module's trust boundary. You don't want the trust stuff from the outside if you can help it. The ITF uh, adopted a newer version of IsaCamp Ike. I still thought it was too complex. Some of us, and this was a group of about seven, both systems people like myself and Matt Blaze, 
and crypto theory people like Bill Aiello proposed a replacement for I called JFK, just fast keying. The IATF adopted it, but at a uh, likely attended meeting, and the next meeting reverted back to Ike version two. Was that right? Well, I still prefer simplicity doing different layering, but it is what it is. There have been other changes to uh, IPsec over the years. Newer cryptographic algorithms and modes of operation. Elliptic curve instead of RSA, AES, which is easy. Combined uh, confidentiality integrity cipher modes which we wanted earlier, but they didn't exist, longer keys. And we ran into another bug. When we realized, when the crypto community realized that MD5 and SHA-1 were broken and they needed to be replaced, we said, okay, fine. You know, uh, NIST started the SHA-3 process and so on. And when Eric Riscorla and I look at Ike and a variety of other ITF protocols, we realized that they couldn't actually negotiate new hash algorithms because they assumed you had the hash algorithm before you could negotiate whether or not it could be used. So the IDF had to go rework the way it did some of its uh, fair no number of protocols, the way it did its negoti negotiation of hash, al hash algorithms to handle the case where there was a newer one known to some machines, but not others. And the sequence number field was too small. In 1995, 32 bits, uh, two to 32nd blocks seemed reasonable. We have much faster networks and much longer lived connections today. I won't try to go over this slide in detail, but it compares the five different protocol versions and candidates. These slides will be up on my web page. So the lessons I would take is you know, the real world cryptographic protocols have to be engineered. It's not just the cryptographic mathematics that matter. People matter. You didn't always have or didn't always heed the right expertise. The process matters. And the requirements will change over time. Speeds increase, threats change, algorithms are improved. So you know, IPsec is relatively stable now, but it's not clear to me that it will remain that way. So did we succeed? ESP is pretty clean, AH a bit less so. We realized late in the game, it was very hard for an application to tell if or how a connection was protected, especially since IPsec could be outboard on your uh, ethernet card or even at your gateway. Maybe there was an API that would have uh, helped, but the IDF doesn't do APIs. Is a camp and Ike was not successful because there was so very, very many options. It made configuration and interoperability extremely difficult. I understand the need for many of these things, but simplicity went by the wayside and even experienced system administrators find it hard to configure. And what happened was that a lot of this was overtaken by events. The ubiquity of the web and the spread of TLS made IPsec less interesting. If you wanted to encrypt a stream connection at an application, TLS just worked and it was easier to configure. Other technologies like NAS and firewalls got in the way of ubiquitous end-to-end -end IPsec. Username selectors were a bad idea that the wrong layer. We did not get the ubiquitous network, network layer encryption that we wanted. We did get virtual private networks and it is still used for that purpose. So I will call it a mixed success. We partly succeeded, partly failed. Some of the success, some of the failure was things we couldn't predict like the rapid spread of TLS. Some of it was errors in design like the complexity. So I will stop sharing my screen now and go to questions. Thank you, Steve. So, um... As questions are slowly pouring in, perhaps you could comment a bit on uh, Martin's remark. He found out you're one of the originators of Usenet, and you said you had some uh, okay. extra comments on that. Yeah, so, uh, and thank you, Kevin, for the uh, suggestion to people read uh, RFC 3514. I think it's the most popular thing I've ever written. Uh, the, uh, okay, so Usenet was invented by myself when I was a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill, 
Tom Truscott, the late Jim Ellis, and uh, uh, I got his name now, uh, at, uh, who were grad students at Duke. And one of the things that we realized was that we, if this was going to be a distributed decentralized network, we wanted some way to control this. And we were designing this in late 79, early 1980. How do you control a distributed decentralized network when there is no authority, no ability to control what's happening on someone else's machine? Well, we all knew about public key cryptography. We had all seen first Martin Gardner's column in Scientific American, I think it was August 78. We'd all read the original RSA paper. So we knew about public key crypto and uh, seventh edition Unix had just come out, which actually had uh, an encrypted, encrypted email uh, set of tools. They never really were used, but the tools that were there, so we even had some source code. And we thought about putting it in, but we realized a number of things boiled down to we didn't know how to engineer it and we knew it. For example, although certificates had been invented at MIT, we knew nothing of them. How do you know that somebody's got, you know, here's a public key, whose public key is it? How do you use that to delete a message that you don't want out there, for example? We knew we didn't know these things, and so we just said, how long should keys be? We didn't know any of this. And we were said, okay, we're just going to ship this thing without the crypto, in fact, the original announcement in January 80 said, lots of potential for abuse. We don't know what's really going to go wrong. Let's get some experience and then we'll fix it. Find out what the real problems are. But if you think about this in 1980, export controls on cryptography existed, but we didn't know about them, which meant that if this had been shipped, we might've had some long unpleasant conversations with federal prosecutors. The patents on public key cryptography and on RSA had not yet been issued. What could have happened had we been a little bit less humble or a little bit, but not a lot more knowledgeable, we could have put all of this stuff into net news. It would have been distributed around the world out there before anybody really realized what was going on before the patents came into force. And good luck trying to enforce those packets, those patents, when by 1984, there were many thousands of nodes, including many outside the US where the patents didn't apply anyway. So it's interesting to think about what might have been different had we gone ahead and said, this was a discussion we had, but we ultimately decided not to do it. And I wonder what where these would have been. I I don't miss the chance to have had those discussions with uh, U.S. attorneys and the law and FBI agents. That that would not have been a uh, experience that I would have enjoyed. I suspect. But uh, so that was the story that was. You know, the odd thing is with with the primitives that exist today, like HMAX and so on. Yeah, you, know, you didn't even have cryptographic hash functions in 1980. I think I could have done it without violating the export rules or any patents that had been issued. But I didn't know it and a lot of this stuff didn't even exist in 1980. But I'm not, I don't have the temptation to go back and reinvent Usenet. If you're really interested, I did a, about a year ago, I did a series of about 10 blog posts that where I recounted the early design decisions and early history of it. And you can go back and uh, read that. But, the crypto piece is, the, is, I think, the one that was the biggest missed, ch missed chance. But again, the, a lot of the primitives didn't exist. And in an era before the, the web and widespread access, most people didn't even know about certificates. I mean, bachelor's thesis of, out of MIT, how, how was I to hear of that? Especially since I was not doing crypto research. My dissertation area was on uh, program correctness and formal verification. Other questions? Yeah, thanks for a really uh, interesting answer. I see that a question came in from Kevin, so I'll read it out loud. 
you said that the ubiquity of HTTP made IP tech less relevant, which raises an interesting point. In the early days of HTTPS, there was a competitor called SHTTP, which would have been more fun to pronounce. The difference as I remember it is that SHTTP drove things down to into HTTP, whereas SSL TLS worked at the TCP layer above. Sometimes it seems better to go to a more general layer, but not always. How do we differentiate? So SHTTP, because of, yeah. HTTPS relies on TLS encryption of the entire connection, it is encrypting you know, just above the TCP layer. It gives you an encrypted channel. SHTTP was a way to encrypt part of an HTT HTML document. And so it was more closely tied to the web. It would have been very interesting because you could then digitally sign things. You could digitally sign your order rather than uh, just you know, putting in your credit card number or what, or what have you. Uh, I, I think the reason that it lost out was that uh, Netscape, which marketed the original web server and web browser was the energy behind SSL 2.0. And uh, that was, and HTTPS was their solution. So they had the running code in both ends of the connection early on. So SHTTP was proposed as an alternative, didn't uh, catch it. Ah, I see Brian Lamacchia pointed, gave a uh, pointer to uh, Kohnfelder's uh, bachelor's thesis. Thank you, Brian. Brian was the one who broke uh, Diffie Hellman Key Exchange at, uh, at Sun. I have a policy question for you. So I was thinking about this kind of parallel world, world that my day job is in now of sort of technology in the stock market microstructure domain. And it's an interesting problem in that the policy and the technology are in conversation and in conflict with each other all the time. But there's a unique challenge faced by the policymakers, let's say at the SEC, for example, who want to understand the technology, but tend to view it kind of reactively, like they want to understand the technology now and make a policy that corrects it. But then of course, the policy leads the technologists down certain paths in response to that. And they don't seem to have a structure for kind of anticipating or thinking through those things. And part of the problem is that all many of the main technologists sort of adversarially align to the regulators and spend their time circumventing the regulation more than sort of sharing some of the same goals. Have you seen examples of uh, issues with that, with getting the right uh, technology expertise into policy? And do you think there need to be kind of solutions like regulators building up their own internal technology stacks? Or do you see a different way to kind of resolve those issues? I think it's hugely important to have people who speak both languages on both sides of that. I spent, I spent at least half my time these days doing law and policy. I'm affiliate faculty at Columbia Law School, as well as a CS professor. You know, I spent a year at the Federal Trade Commission as chief technologist advising the chair and the commissioners on technology issues, spent another year part-time with the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board in a, in a uh, similar role. Ed Felt now is actually a board member at PCLOB. So it really is very important for people on the policy and regulatory side to really understand the technology and have their own understanding of it, not just to what they're told by the people they're regulating. I think it's hugely important. I think it's hugely important to get people who speak uh, both languages. Uh, I've become the unofficial advisor at Columbia for CS majors who want to go to law school. I have two who are in law school right now. I've got three recommendation letters to write in the next month. Uh, you know, this, we need these people. We need them very badly. So I have a question coming in here uh, as a personal message on the Zoom yeah. chat. So the question is, there are four different authentication mechanisms in Ike. How come both public key encryption and revised mode of public key encryption in the protocol? So the question is, when the protocol is already complicated, why have two options? Yeah, that's a good question. 
Uh, I should caution that I have not really been involved in this in the last 15 years more. Since I became a faculty member, I had to decouple from the IDF, so I know very little about what's happened in the last 15 years. Different people had different needs. You know, one of my pushes for simplification was have only public key uh, signing as an authentication mechanism. And if you need something like passwords or, or one time, uh, time based passwords, what have you, have a separate outboard protocol that does nothing but retrieve your uh, private, securely retrieve your private key from some store using uh, you know, variants of PAKES, for example, to securely store your uh, private key someplace. Uh, if you want password authentication, fine. Log into someplace that will take your password and issue a you a short-lived certificate. I prefer to have multiple simpler protocols than one complex one. I find it easier to analyze, but uh, I did not win, the, win that fight. I see that uh, Kevin is continuing his question uh, about applications versus, versus network layer. So Kevin is asking, we are now using Zoom with the little thing at the upper left that says using advanced encryption, but I have no idea whether IPsec would be appropriate for a UDP based protocol like video that could happily drop frames. Has IPsec been overlooked where it could be used? The question from Kevin McCurley. Yeah, okay. So, yes and no. IPsec would handle UDP very well. It was, that was always one of the requirements. The, you know, but IPsec was, you know, this was a mistake we made early on. We wanted more application layer talking to IPsec. And that is difficult because IPsec is at the IP layer. It's got this TCP layer in the middle. The IPsec could be on your uh, Ethernet card or your firewall and so on. And uh, it, I, I regard that approach as a mistake. You still want it for VPNs where you're trying to protect everything, but for protecting an individual application, you're better off with much more application knowledge of what has been done and more you know, easier ability for the application to say what it wants to be done. I mean, we tried, I think that we failed. I think the, uh, the example that convinced me that it was bad to try to do uh, IPsec for uh, application encryption was suppose you wanted to protect the old R login, remote login command, which again, once upon a time used address-based authentication. When you connect to the far end, fine. I'm going to key my side with my key, as Steve Bellman. But the far side is initially answering as root because it can be logging you in as anybody. It doesn't know. So on one end, it's Steve's key. At the other end, it's root's key that then later on wants to switch to Steve's key. And especially if you're trying to talk at different security levels, this is a multi-level secure system. You can use a top secret algorithm. I can use uh, a confidential algorithm and so on. So uh, it, trying to switch keys in that context got really, really messy. And that was what finally convinced me that it was a bad, that it was a bad approach and one that was rightfully abandoned. So Dan Bernstein has a, a question or a remark that seems to be uh, related to that. So he's asking for the protocol struggling to deploy TLS securely. Do you think there's any hope for the original plan of encrypting the whole network layer? The problem with encrypting the whole network layer is who is using the certificates to everybody? You know, it's messy enough with the uh, web PKI. We've got how many hundreds of CAs? Certificate transparency is a band-aid on top of that very necessary, I won't say bad decision, but it's, it's an unpleasant decision that you had to go add another mechanism as a, as a band-aid on top of it. If I want to connect from A to B, if I control both ends, I don't need a CA. Uh, but if I want to connect to some, someplace random, I do need a CA. And is that the web CA? It, it, got, it got complicated. You know, at this point, it almost doesn't matter because 
so much of the web, so much of the internet is protected at application layer. Virtually all web traffic is HTTPS uh, at this point. Email is protected via TLS, uh, SFTP over TLS, and IMAP over TLS. Uh, Zoom is protected by their own, by their own encryption uh, mechanism. There are other video standards with their own. You know, Cisco's WebEx has got end-to-end -end encryption and so on. So at this point, all of the protocols that are being devised have their own application layer encryption. There are things that are not easily protected, with, uh, like DNS, but DNS is awfully hard to protect as far as I'm concerned anyway, because you're talking to untrusted parties and forwarding and caching and so on. You know, you've got the DNS over HTTPS standard. I'm not a big fan of that because I don't think it's protecting you from people you really need protecting from. It's not an end-to-end -end protocol. I would love to see more end-to-end -end email encryption, but no one's yet cracked the uh, human factors piece of that. Uh, and again, part of that is key recovery when you drop your phone in a puddle and uh, don't want to trust who, uh, whomever on that. So uh, it's an extraordinarily hard problem. I don't think we're going to get the ubiquitous cryptography, but I think we have so much of it that at this point that we almost don't need what we had then, what we tried for then. And it's still the traffic analysis problem. Also related to that is an explosion of the number of passwords that you need to use and remember for all kinds of uh, applications. Yeah. Do you think if you're looking back at the past few decades, um, are we going in the right direction? Uh, and how do you see things evolving? Um, are we helping to, work, to make the world more secure? But, or are they maybe, um, uh, is the complexity increasing to such a point that it's becoming uh, very difficult to keep track of where um, problems might be? I think the problem is where it has been for decades, and that's the software. Software is this nasty, unpleasant, buggy stuff. You know, uh, the line I used to use is uh, bad software trumps good crypto. Now I use bad software beats great good crypto. Uh, I must have changed the verb for some reason. But, uh, you know, you don't go through strong crypto, you go around it. You know, the primitives that we're using today, AES, the post uh, quantum uh, algorithms look to be really, really good. You know, to my knowledge, in 45 years, the only attack on DES stronger than brute force was linear, noticeably strong was linear cryptanalysis. And that was never very practical because the, you didn't want to send that many blocks before a key change in CBC mode anyway. And the only weakness in DES was the key length, and that was designed in by NSA. So, uh, yeah, but the software, maybe we're going to get good secure software someday, but I'm not holding my breath. I mean, Windows, I'm a Mac user. Windows 10, I think, is considerably more secure. And uh, last Tuesday, Microsoft shipped, what, 120 patches on Patch Tuesday? Uh, yeah, software is this nasty stuff. We've got to get rid of it. The complexity of the you know, systems today are far bigger and far more robust than they were when I started this field 50 or so years ago. But the, the complexity has grown at least as fast. So yeah, things are a lot better, but there's still a lot of bad stuff out there. But for authentication, I think we're going to move more and more towards the ubiquitous identifier and cryptographic token, our phones. We always have them with us. Uh, you know, the iOS and Android are pretty well designed. The phones are getting more and more secure. Outboard authenticators like uh, the U2F and FIDO keys and so on. So I think we're solving that problem, but I'm worried about the application layer, the software. Mm -hmm. I think the question that Kevin has is a bit related to this. So he says, Zoom uses a proprietary system, but WebRTC is a standard that allows different implementations. 
are standards dying at the application level? Some are, some aren't. The web standards are pretty well followed because there are enough different web browsers and web, ser and web servers out there to keep the vendors honest. Uh, you, know. you go back a couple of decades and you had some vendors trying to get proprietary extensions into the web that, uh, that others couldn't emulate. We don't see nearly as much of that anymore. Places where we don't have interoperability, like video conferencing, you know, I've got about five different video conferencing apps uh, on my computer or on my uh, phone or tablet, because some people want Zoom and some people want WebEx and some want Skype and some want Signal and some want GoToMeeting and some want Google Meeting. And these things don't interoperate and that's a problem. Uh, it would be nice if they did. Oh, Stuart, no, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> uh, smart contracts. The, the existence of Bucky software is exactly why I don't like smart contracts. Sorry smart about contracts, that. What? I, did, I didn't mean to provoke you. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew you were, I knew that was dog and cheek. Come on. I know you better than that. Uh, I couldn't resist. <laughs> So I was a little shocked to hear you say that these will be the universal method of authentication because of the side effects for privacy. Uh, yeah, but it's a deployment issue and engineering issue. You know, the phones today are very well engineered. You know, the iOS security architecture is not perfect. The implementation is not perfect but it's quite good. You know, Apple's done a pretty good job at locking themselves out of the phones. They haven't managed to lock out Cellbrite and Grayship, but, uh, uh, it, but it's pretty good. The point is that it's something that's ubiquitous and people will notice their, uh, people will notice their loss. Uh, my last book, when I was working on the book, uh, my, visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there's a sculpture there. You can actually find it online on the Met's website because they've put all their artwork freely avail uh, available, or most of it, I should say. Uh, the, the statue is called Indian Girl or the Dawn of Christianity. But you know, when you walk in and see this thing, your first reaction is, here's this girl looking down at her cell phone and she's not even dressed yet. And that was my immediate reaction to it. And when I did some Googles and so on, uh, I found I was not the only one who had that reaction to it. You know, she's staring at something in her hand. When you look closely, you see it's a crucifix. But to a modern audience, especially to a modern non-Christian like myself, it was a phone. Uh, you have your phone. You have it with you almost all of the time. You know when you, you, you know, very soon when you've forgotten or forgotten that you've, or you've lost it. It's got a lot of computing capability. It's got short range radio to go talk to your uh, computer and so on. It's not perfect, but it meets a lot of the check boxes and so on. It, I, could there be a better solution? Sure. But when you talk about engineering and market forces, I tend that that's where my guess is right now. So are you confident in what uh, Google Play services runs on Android phones? I'm sorry, I didn't do you. Do you have confidence in what Google Play services does on Android phones, which is a majority of the phones in the world? I don't have confidence in any software. I didn't say it was the best choice. I said I thought it was going to be the winning choice. Uh, there's a difference. The uh, It's getting... It's getting better. Android historically was not as good. It was held back by the tremendous variety of different uh, underlying hardware platforms. Apple controls their hardware so they can go put in the secure enclave, et cetera, et cetera. And Google is dependent on Samsung and Huawei and everybody else to uh, put in the right hardware features. Uh, I suspect it will often be good enough. I don't, you know, I worry tremendously about software complexity and attack surface. Uh, but
but that's a different question. So I still wanted to ask Steve, are you worried that somebody might go to your cell phone provider to try to take over your number? Yes. But that's why you don't <laughs> want to that's why that's why you don't want to tie the authentication to something as easily stolen as a phone number. Uh-huh. You know, uh, it, I think that SMS two-factor authentication is far better than password only, but it's not going to defend against uh, even a semi-sophisticated uh, uh, targeted attack of someone who's going to uh, yeah, st uh, steal your phone number. On the other hand, you know, for the next step up, I've got the DuoSec authenticator on my phone. I have to, I need it because uh, my university has mandated it. and Swapping, you know, stealing my phone is not going to steal the cryptographic keys that uh, duo, that uh, the DuoSec app has. It would be better to have something like U2F on my phone speaking via near field communication to my computer. Sure, because that's bi-directional authentication of the actual cryptographic session. But uh, it's less convenient to use and it's one more thing to carry around. Maybe next year I'll have that feature. I don't right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess on that note, it might be a good time to end the session. Uh, I would like to thank you, Steve, and I would also like to thank all of the people who presented today and who attended today for uh, being here. And um, I hope there will be a uh, next CPL next year, where all of you will attend again, uh, hopefully in person. Um, and we're looking forward to your participation in your uh, submissions. I remember traveling. I used to do that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let me, um, yeah, sorry. Let me add one more thing to that, which is, yes, please, if you're inspired by all the brave people sharing their failures today, please consider submitting to CFL 2021. We will exist. I don't know in what form yet, but it's very on brand for us to, to fail at changing or keeping the same format. So we will definitely do something. And yes, thank you so much, Steve, uh, for, for being with us today and, and sharing your, your insights and your failure. Um, we really appreciate it. Okay. See you all on the net.